So today's the tenth of Tevis. Today is the first of a series of fasts enacted by the sages, by the prophets, and they're all connected with the destruction of the first and second base Amigdash. The second base Amigdash, the destruction of the second temple, begins our long and bitter exile. The fast which our sages enacted, the first one is today, the 10th of Tavis. What happened on the 10th of Tavis? The 10th of Tavis actually is with the first temple and the king of Babylon, the Bechadnezzar, this is some 500, 425 years BCE. The king of Babylon laid siege to Yerushalayim. And then some 30 months later, the walls were breached. They held them off for 30 months. The walls were breached on the 17th of Tammuz. That's another fast day. And then three weeks later, the temple was set fire to Tisha B'Av. That's the culminating fast day. And then there's a fourth fast day, which we fast the day after Rosh Hashanah, at same Gedalia, which was the murder, the assassination of uh, the Jewish leader at the time, a man called Gedalia. And this dashed all hopes of independence. This is around the first temple period, after the first temple. But so today's event the tenth of Tavis again is when Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Yerushalayim. Now, there's an interesting law about the tenth of Tavis, and that is when it falls on a Friday like this year, we fast. That is not true of any of the other fasts. If any of the other fasts would fall on a Friday, it would be deferred to Sunday. Not so the tenth of Tavis. The reason is because the language used in scripture to refer to this day is the same language scripture uses to refer to Yom Kippur. Three words, on this very day. So since these words, appear with respect to Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur we fast even if it falls on a Friday, which it doesn't nowadays, I mean, it doesn't for thousands of years since the calendar has been fixed, but in theory it could and did in the past. And even if it falls on Shabbos, we fast. So the tenth of Tavis that is framed in Scripture with the very same words, we fast also no matter when it falls. Now, the way our calendar works now, it's been fixed for some 2,000 years and predetermined. I'm not going to go into now how the Jewish calendar used to work and now it does work, but now it's predetermined, so it never falls on Shabbos, but sometimes rarely fall on Friday like this year. And like unlike other fasts, we do fast on Friday, which means we break our fast over our Kiddush tonight. So that's the reason we will fast today on Friday. Additionally, why we fast even if it falls on Friday and don't defer? Because why would we defer it? Because you don't want to go from the, the stark contrast of fasting into feasting. Shabbos is a day of delight and feasting. It's unhealthy and it's jarring. Moreover, moreover, jarring to the body. Moreover, it would mean we're really fasting on Shabbos because we bring Shabbos in when? candlelighting time, which is 18 minutes before sunset, and here we're only breaking our fast after nightfall. It's a good hour into the Shabbos, and we don't want to fast on Shabbos. That's all the other fasts, but not this one, like Yom Kippur. We will fast that hour into Shabbos, as we will today. So the other reason is, we'll get back to Yom Kippur presently, the other reason is because it's the beginning of all the tragedies. All the tragedies which followed, breaching of the wall, the setting of the fire to the base of Midrash on Tisha B'Av, and even the second temple. 
The second temple is a continuation of the first. So this sets in motion all of the tragedies that followed along the last 2,000 years of Jewish suffering in exile. All begins with this day, the day the walls were surrounded, Jerusalem was laid siege to. Because it's the beginning, therefore it has a strictness that the other ones, even Tisha B'Av, doesn't have. If Tisha B'Av, in theory, would have fallen on Shabbos or Friday, we would not fast. It's postponed till Sunday, which Tisha B'Av does fall on Shabbos sometimes, and we fast on Sunday. But not this one, because it's the beginning. We appreciate that. Uh, the very beginning of something um, is the beginning, and therefore... Uh, has the greatest severity to it. So that's why we will fast. Now let's understand all of this a little bit deeper and what the message is for you and I. Everything which Hashem does is for our good. Now, punishments. This is a punishment. This was foretold by the prophets. The prophets begged the Jews to repent. They didn't. The prophets were told what would happen, and it happened. <clears throat> so, a punishment in our world, in human <clears throat> societies, punishments, what's the point of a punishment? It's to afflict pain, to serve as a deterrent. You know you're going to do such and such and such. You're going to pay for it, either monetary punishment or imprisonment or capital punishment. So the point of the punishment is to inflict suffering. Not simply as revenge, but also to serve as a deterrent for others and for the person himself. He didn't heed it, but knowing that it would come, it should have deterred him from doing it. That's how it is. That's how society punishes. He uses jail, you know, whatever it is, financial. Uh, uh, financial uh, fines and, and, the, and the like. Not so with God. The point of punishment is not you sinned, now suffer. Or not you sinned, uh, here's the suffering that others or even you should, should realize is coming. So don't do it as a deterrent. Rather, it's cleansing. It's meant to cleanse. That can be painful, like an operation or a tooth extraction or drilling the tooth to remove the, uh, the decay. But the point is not the pain. The point is to cleanse. The deep cleansing means it's more sensitive. So that's how it is for Hashem. But more than that, not only is it cleansing, but when the punishment comes, or even the quote-unquote threat of it, or prophecy of it, here's the point, friends. Contained in the very prophecy or the event is actually the means by which to avoid it and transform the impending tragedy. To avoid it. It's a divine message in the nature of what is about to happen or is happening is a message by which we can achieve victory, redemption, and uh, the agency, the enemy, will be defeated or abandon the project. Case in point, what is the message that God is sending that today, this fast day, which begins it all, the siege of Jerusalem. What does this mean spiritually? Explanation. What's Yerushalayim? The word Yerushalayim is actually two words. Yira Sholem. And that means, Sholem means perfect or whole. And Yira means awe or vision. It's both to see and awe. 
meaning Jerusalem is a place where one can behold the Almighty, see and feel the presence of God, certainly when the temple stood, which was the reality then. They had the temple. And it engenders a perfect awe of God. Sholem, whole, complete. Peace. Peace means when something is whole, not fractured. Fractured is the opposite of peace, division. So Sholem means peace, it means whole. It means all the parts, if there are parts, are harmonious and connected. So that word means two things, peace and whole, because that's what peace means. So Yerushalayim means harmony inspired by experiencing God. That's a year to see and a year to be in awe, engendering an awe of God, humility, and therefore unity. Yes, there can be no unity without humility. Because if it's my ego, then you're a threat. But if there's humility, then there can be unity. That's what Yerushalayim is. That's what the experience of Yerushalayim is all about. That's the reality of Yerushalayim. So what's the siege? The siege is nobody can go in and nobody can go out. What's the divine message? Kindalach, says the Almighty. You're all one. You're all in this together. Unite. Unite in Yerushalayim. Unite inspired by the awe of God. The awesome experience of the divine. That is available to you here in Jerusalem, in the Holy Temple. Don't turn your backs on it. Siege means no foreigner enters and no one within leaves. You are a Jewish people. You are all one. Unite. Had we gotten the message and united, then this, the physical siege would have been over for it would have served its purpose. He would have either abandoned or he would have been defeated. Many ways that God can, can uh, carry out his will. So in this tragedy initially, the message, which we didn't get sadly, is in a word, unite. Unite under the banner of Yerushalayim. And that explains an oddity about the way this fast day is described in Allah. If you look at the quote I sent you, second quote, the first one, the first one that I sent you yesterday, right? So four lines, Last word of the third line, referring to this fast day. Vasidi Betevis, what happened on the 10th of Tevis? The Rambam, this is from Maimonides, the Rambam, the law fasts. He's telling us what happened on each of these events in Maui fast, why they were established as fast days. She so says about this day, Shabai Somach Melech Bovel Nebuchadnezzar Harosha Al Yerushalayim. This was the day, now the word Somach, Telling it means a siege. We're going to address that word again in a moment. The king of Bavel, the wicked Nebuchadnezzar, laid siege to Jerusalem. The problem is that the word Samach actually means support. It usually has a, a positive connotation. Here it means that he leaned on it. He leaned on it all around and no one could get in or out. But why in heaven's name use a name as we say in the Ashrei, I'm sorry, in the, the Ashrei, yes, and also in Shemanesra, God supports those who fall. It's usually, the word support, I don't have to tell you, is uh, generally 
a positive connotation. So this is a terribly negative event. Why is it the Rambam, quoting from our sages, using phraseology that implies something profoundly positive, a support, an assist? And you just got the answer because had we taken the message from it, in the end, it will assist and support us and bolster us. Had we gotten the message of what? We are all one. We're all in this together. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. And we have to connect and relate to each other in this perfect wholeness. Yerushalayim. Sholem. Peace. Whole, wholesomeness. Wholeness. Completeness. Oneness. Humility. Or all of this is conveyed in the word Yerushalayim. That's what he's supporting. And had you responded accordingly, that's what would have happened. Today, we are all in a siege. This is the Asara Batavis of history, the last 71 days, increasingly. The world has surrounded us, and it's crying and screaming. I saw a, uh, a clip of a concert in Chile, in Chile of all places, thousands of people. It was the only frightening thing that I actually saw happening in the world that was really in a frenzy, friends. Dancing, stomping, jumping, pumping their hands, young people in the air in a frenzy, calling for the elimination of Israel. In the most, it's in Spanish, but you can pick up some of the words. In the most derisive way, there's a mockery to the tone. Chili. So we're in a siege. The fingers are pointing, the accusations. The call, like in Sydney, Australia, for gassing of Jews. And this is happening in the halls of academia. Harvard, Penn University, MIT, Columbia. I cite them because of the failure of leadership to condemn this. Calling for the gassing of Jews does not violate the code, the ethical code of these universities. That's a wonderful thing, my friends. That's wonderful in the sense that it's exposed that education that isn't based on godliness and holiness and morality, this is the end result. But the irony, of course, is that these universities, funded by billions of Jewish dollars over the decades, not millions, billions, the dream of every Jewish mother Father, too, that the kids should go to Harvard and Columbia. And the betrayal from the highest, most revered institutions of the Western world, the elite universities, the siege begins there. So what's our response? Our response is exactly what you heard. Somach Melech Bavel. This can be the great, greatest support for us. We need, and this is what's happening, Baruch Hashem, is Jewing, Jews uniting in this deep, deep way and embracing our Jewishness in the deepest way. I told you the story of the story, the clip of one of the soldiers. There's a shortage of tefillin, friends. There's a shortage of tzitzis because the IDF. Every soldier wants many soldiers. So one of the fellows is saying he's putting on film every day and he says, don't get me wrong, I'm not becoming religious and I'm not religious. So why am I doing this? Because I'm Jewish. That's the deepest truth. Mitzvahs don't make us anything. Mitzvahs reveal who we are. You don't put on film to become religious. Don't become anything. You put on film because you are Jewish. And film expresses who you are. 
doesn't define you, it expresses you. It doesn't make you anything, it expresses you. Shabbos doesn't make me Jewish, it expresses my Jewish. And that's true of every mitzvah. There's 613, because there are 613 parts of the soul and the body that are begging to be liberated and expressed. And that's what the mitzvahs do. That's what they're for. That's what's happening now in this deep, deep way. We are all one. We are all Jewish. Equally, we're here for each other. There are those that are putting their lives down on the line every moment for their fellow Jew, which is nothing higher. So as the world has encircled us, encircled us like the king of Babylon, the Mechadnetzer HaRosha, the wicked Mechadnetzer, the Rambam just described him. The Rambam himself uses the word Somach. He laid, he supported Jerusalem. In the end, if we, and we are, getting the divine message in all of this, Kindalach, wake up. You're Jewish. Embrace it. Stop pretending like everybody else. They don't buy it. It's not true. And that's the end of the siege. And then the world is at peace with us. Now, final teaching. Let's get it. Oh, okay. The final teaching. I want you to look at the second quote I just sent you. We'll go through very quickly now because we've got five minutes left. All these, even less. Says the Rambam, all these commemorative in the English fasts will be nullified in the Messianic era. And indeed, ultimately, they will all be transformed into holidays and days of rejoicing and celebration. And he goes on to bring the verse in Zechariah in Hebrew. Not just would be the nullified, they'll be yomtev and days of rejoicing and gladness. And he goes on to bring the Pasek. Now the question is this. We'll address it next week. It's a very, the question is a simple question, but the answers are very, very profound and very relevant. The question is this. We have a principle. It's a principle of logic. If you tell me you have $200, I know you have $100. The chlal masayim on it. The bigger includes the lesser. So you don't have to tell me I've got two, I've got $200. And I have a hundred dollars. Not an addition. You're saying you're describing your wallet. You're saying there's two hundred here and there's a hundred here. If you tell me there's two hundred, I know there's a hundred. So in theory, everything is precise. So here's the question: The Rambam says, first he says the days will be nullified. We don't want fasting when Mashiach comes. Not only we will not fast, but the days will be days of feasting and rejoicing. The question is. Just say the second thing. Say in the future, these days will be days of sosein. Simcha means feasting. Of joy, food, meat, wine. That's what simcha means. There'll be Yom Tov. That's Yom Tov. Yom Tov mitzvah is to eat meat, and, eat meat and drink wine. So just say in the future, there'll be Yom Tov and days of sosein and feasting. In order you know, we're not fasting. That means that they're not sad fast days anymore. So why is he stating the patently obvious when it's already included in the second statement? Question number one. Question number two. The Rambam is a book of halacha. The Rambam is a book of halacha, which is how I have to behave now. Why is he telling me what's going to be when Mashiach comes? Don't you look in the prophets and in in in, in the Nevi'im, the prophets in in the Medrash, and it's many of source many sources. What's he doing in the book of of Practical instruction. And not just the Rambam, the other source of the tour, other classic, very, it's, it's, it's like very, it hits the reader. The tour, these classic halachic codifiers, different wording, but the same content, talk about the future, it's going to be celebration. That's not a halacha, so what do I do now about that? Nothing. I do mitzvahs, we got to do tshuva. Why is it there? 
why, the question is clear, why in a book of practical instruction are we getting this wonderful prophecy, which is wonderful, but the place is not to be written here. The place is where it's written in, in Zechariah, in Tanakh, and in all the other inspirational works that are written. The answer is, we'll start just to answer now one word. The point of the fast days, friends, is not to be in anguish, to mourn. There is, there is fasting, which is mourning, a sad event. You're denying yourself food and drink, and you're deliberately kind of hurting yourself because you're identifying with the tragedy which took place. Mourning. That is one dimension to the fast, but not the essence of the fast. The essence of the fast is to induce teshuva. And Yom Kippur is the model. Yom Kippur is not a sad day. It's a Yom Tov. In fact, the greatest Yom Tov. Is there a bigger Yom Tov possible than the possibility of a second chance and forgiveness and renewal and rebirth? So what's the fasting in Yom Kippur? The fasting in Yom Kippur is to unlock the soul, humility, and induce a deep teshuva. Which explains something else. If the fast was only mourning, there's a limit to mourning, my friends. You know how to mourn forever. You look, God forbid, a person lose an halacha. There's three days, there's shiva, there's shloishim, there's yartzeit. You're not allowed to mourn longer than the law tells you. It's thousands of years later, we're mourning the same event. That's contrary to halacha itself. The answer is no, this is not mourning. This is the fasting is to shiva, to rectify the tragedy and turn it about and bring redemption. That's the point of the fasting. Just like Yom Kippur. The fasting of Yom Kippur is not sadness, but repentance, humility, driven. And it's a joyous thing. I'm going to change and I can change. And why are we fasting? Because we're transcending the body's limits. We're tapping into our soul, into the deepest part of us, a deep, a deep reflection. We transcend food on Yom Kippur. It's not a punishment. It's beyond the need for food and drink. It's the soul day. The day to contemplate our life and where we are, where we're going, and the great gift of renewal. And in essence, that's the same of all the fast days, which is why we continue to fast every year until we fix it. So we're going to see next week. Right? The Rambam saying these things, describing in the Messianic era, he's telling us the nature of how we got to do Teshuvah now, which we'll see next week. And by saying, A, it's going to be nullified, and B, they're going to be turned into Yom Tev, he's telling us there's two levels of Teshuvah we need to engage, embark upon now, that will bring to that. Two levels of repentance. Nullify the negative, transform it, to be explained next week, God willing, in greater length. Have a wonderful day. May Mashiach come today. And this day already will be a day of feasting and celebration.